Welcome, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with the grand lecture, and we welcome whoever else finds their way over to the other side of the screen here. This is called a grand lecture, but it's actually more of a conversation today. I'm Jennifer Johnson. I'm the moderator. I'm the Associate Dean for Undergraduate and Integrated Studies at the Weatherhead School of Management. And I'm so happy to be here today. This weekend is, has really very special meaning for me, because in addition to being an administrator and a faculty member, I'm also an alumna and I'm a case mom, and a very proud one. In our grand lecture or con grand conversation today, we're going to introduce you to some of our university's bright, brightest stars under the age of 30. And if you've looked at the, um, the latest edition of Think, which is on your chairs, each of our panelists today has a page or a, a information in the booklet. Okay. Today, you're going to hear about their successes, their challenges, and how their experiences at Case Western Reserve University influenced who they are today. I'm going to start out by asking some discussion questions just to get the ball rolling, but we'll also open it up to you if you have other things on your mind that you'd like to ask them. I'd like to welcome our panelists. Each pursued a different academic and career interest while at the university, and each has an exciting story to tell. Timothy Cook is a 2008 graduate who majored in theater. Tim recently returned from London after serving as an associate director under the Tony Award-winning director for a West End production of Peter and Alice, which featured actress Judi Dench. Rebecca Gilbert Weisberg earned a law degree in 2012. Rebecca was one of the youngest attorneys ever to join Warner Brothers. Her journey started when Rebecca introduced herself to the company's CEO, Barry Myers, also an alum of the law school, when he was here on campus to give a speech. Andrew Witte graduated in 2009 with a major in computer engineering. Andrew developed Pebble, a watch, which by the way he's wearing this afternoon, a watch which gathered $10.2 million in investment money on Kickstarter, which was the highest amount in the crowdfunding website's history. So welcome our panelists. And first, what I'd like to do is ask each of our panelists to tell you about their current career. What, you know, apart from the little bit of information that I gave you, what they're doing, what they're up to, and we'll take it from there. Uh, let's start with Andrew. Sure. Um, so I s actually started my career before coming to Case, which is a little bit odd, but um, I worked in software development for web applications and enterprise software, and that was interesting, but I wanted to, to do something a little bit more physical and hands-on. Um, so I came to Case and studied computer engineering. When I graduated, I kind of found myself falling back into the software field. Um, I did that for a couple of years, and then I decided I, I want to make something physical, and I want to um, move to the San Francisco Bay Area where there's a lot of um, technology, technology entrepreneurial activity um, and be a part of that scene. Um, so I did, and after moving to California, I met um, Eric Mijikovsky, who had invented um, a smartwatch, started working with him, um, and for two and a half years now, uh, I've been working on the product that became the Pebble smartwatch, um, developed it really from scratch alongside Eric, uh, launch it on Kickstarter, uh, and help to build the company and build the product and take it through manufacturing and start to, to come up with, with new ideas since then. Thank you. Rebecca? Uh, I work for Warner Brothers Television as a production attorney. Uh, what that basically means is uh, we handle about 50 scripted shows from Warner Brothers as well as a few reality shows. And among my department, they get separated by attorney. So I am responsible for four of our shows right now. Um, all, all of them are basically new shows. Mom is on CBS. Uh, the Tomorrow People is a CW show. Sullivan and Son and Ground Floor, both on TBS. So for those four shows, I handle all the writer, director, producer, guest star, 
uh, those types of agreements and negotiate with the Asian agents and kind of come to a, an understanding. And as well, we also handle all the development projects. So TV is very cyclical, like a school year. So right now we're in development and we're buying blogs, books, ideas, all that kind of stuff. And I will do those agreements as well. So while we're always coming up with new ideas, we're also handling the current shows and making sure everything runs smoothly. And we are the first call when everything is not running smoothly. So it's kind of different every day. Thanks, Rebecca. Tim. Uh, yeah, I'm a 2008 graduate. Uh, I'm currently living in New York City. I'm a freelance theater director there, um, working on uh, a lot of my own projects, uh, working on uh, developing relationships with playwrights. I just directed a new uh, world premiere play at a festival in the East Village this August. And also for the last uh, two and a half years, uh, is that me? We have. Oh, even better. Um, uh, for the last two and a half years, I've been working as the associate director for two different directors um, nationally and also in London. Uh, Moises Kaufman, who's the uh, founding uh, artistic director of the Tectonic Theater Project. I worked for him in Los Angeles and uh, on Broadway uh, this past season and two seasons ago as well. Uh, and then uh, also Michael Grandage, who's a British director, uh, Tony and Olivier uh, award-winning director. Uh, I worked for him uh, in Los Angeles at Center Theatre Group on a production of the play Red by John Logan. Um, it starred Alfred Molina and Jonathan Groff. And then uh, most recently this spring on the world premiere of John's new play, uh, Peter and Alice, uh, which starred uh, Judy Dench and Ben Wishaw in the title roles. Thank you all. That, that's a lot of activity since you graduated. Uh, we'd like to hear why it was you came to Case in the first place. So we'll go back to Andrew. What made you come here? Sure, I'm not, I'm not sure if it was any one reason, but a combination of reasons. And I visited a lot of schools before deciding to come here. And, and so it was a combination of factors uh, that brought me here to Case. One thing that, uh, I'm an engineer, but I have a little bit of a soft spot for the liberal arts. And I was excited that uh, Case was starting um, this thing called Sages. Uh, the year that uh, that I came here, and it it turned out to be something that was, was kind of had to be debugged a little bit those first few years, and it was pretty pretty popular for science and engineering students to kind of hate on Sages those first few years of the program. But really, that was something that attracted me to Case. Thank you. I was attracted to Case for probably two reasons. Um, one, when I was graduating from undergrad at Miami of Ohio, I knew I wanted to do something in entertainment. So naturally, I thought, look at law schools in LA and New York. And at the time, my then boyfriend, now husband, got a job in Cleveland. So I started looking at law schools back in Cleveland, and my whole family lives in Cleveland. And so I looked at Case, and I discovered that Barry Meyer, the former CEO of Warner Brothers, uh, was a Case alum. So I thought, you know, it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. And so I went to the school. And um, it's funny because that idea of this one alum is what led me to Warner Brothers in the end. Because my first year at Case Law, we had an interim dean. And nobody would give me Barry's contact information because alumni relationships weren't that strong at the time. But then as my career at Case progressed, my second year, I found out that Barry was giving the commencement address for the graduating 3Ls. And I like stalked every dean and department head on, camp on the campus until they let me meet him, which they did. And I got to meet Barry. And then uh, after that, I uh, just kind of developed a relationship with him. And I started emailing. And in my third year of law school, I got an email back that, from his assistant that he had five minutes in April. So I booked a flight immediately, flew out to LA. And he had me meet with a bunch of different individuals, which eventually led to my job. So that alumni star at Case is what attracted uh, me to the school and led to Warner Brothers. Thank you. Uh, I think it was a couple of different factors for me. One, um, which was definitely the, the tipping point, was I came to the prospective theater students weekend that uh, the theater department held every, uh, every year for people who are interested in coming to the school. Um, I was able to see a production, meet with faculty, sit in on classes, um, and also I think very importantly, uh, see some of the work that the students were doing in the black box space, which uh, inside Eldred Theater in the basement, there's a 99 seat black box, which is a student lab where they can, where we can all put up our own work, uh, which is the most invaluable thing 
uh, ever. Uh, and I was able to see an improv show down there and some other things working down there and just seeing uh, the resources that were at hand uh, that the theater department was giving to its students, that, that was a huge deciding factor. Um, and also uh, proximity, actually. I'm from Sandusky, Ohio, which is just an hour uh, west of Cleveland. And I, I'm close to my family, and I knew I wanted to be close to home but still have a world-class education, and that's exactly what Case Western offers. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I did promise a conversation, so let me ask another question and just open it up and, and talk as you will. Um, what were some of the things that you did while you were here at Case, apart from stalking faculty? Um, it worked. Yeah, but it did work. It did, and and it, I, I love the, there's a fine line between networking and stalking, I guess, and it, <laughs> it depends on the situation. Uh, but what are some of the things that you did here? that you thought were particularly beneficial and you see now with your success that you have, you can make some connections back to those experiences on campus. So anyone who wants to start. Uh, I mean, my, my biggest thing with Case, and it relates to what I just said, is with the alumni. Uh, every job I've gotten in, in sports and entertainment is related to Case alumni. Uh, my second year, I ended up getting an offer from a law firm to practice, I think it was employment law, which I had absolutely no interest in. And it paid well. And I was like, you know what, this is not where my heart's at. And so I decided to start focusing on entertainment opportunities. And I found case alumni at both IMG, which is a sports agency downtown, as well as the Weather Channel. And so by reaching out to them, I ended up getting both, of my, both summer offers through case uh, alumni. So I think the best thing that I found is working with the alumni here at the school because they're very interested in helping and fostering those relationships and getting you to where you've, you know, where they've been. And I kind of feel the same way. Whenever I get a LinkedIn or a Facebook from anybody at Case, I'm happy to talk to them and share my experiences because, you know, I, I, Tim and I were just talking about this. That I think there's this perception that, you know, if you're born and raised in the Midwest, you're not necessarily gonna find opportunities, whether in Los Angeles or New York or San Francisco, and that's just not true. So I think reaching out to the alumni and making those, those relationships was the most important thing that I found. And, I, and thank you, because I'm going to use your stories when I'm involved in the recruiting efforts of bringing more students into Do campus. Yeah. Have them call me. <laughs> I, all right. Alumni networking. I yeah. love it. Um, for me on campus, uh, to kind of go uh, back to what I was saying before, is just uh, I mean, theater is, it, it's uh, such a practical craft. Uh, you need to be doing it. That's how you learn to do it. Um, and and the, the, uh, Eldred is just fantastic about, you know, pushing you to be doing your own projects in the black box space. Um, I was able to assume some great leadership roles with Improvment, the Improv Troupe, and also the Student Theater Group, Players Theater Group. Um, through Players Theatre Group specifically in my senior year here, I created a new Playwrights Festival. Um, we took over the black box for a week. We produced um, six new plays um, written by students, directed by students, um, featuring students. Uh, and it was not just theater majors either. It was bringing in, um, there was a girl who was studying physics who wrote a play. There were engineers who were acting in them. I mean, it was a really uh, great selection from the university. Uh, at large, all in this little black box, creating theater together um, and sharing in that. Uh, that was a hugely valuable experience, I think, both in um, learning about leadership and sort of shepherding a large team through a large endeavor like that. Um, that's something that translates to my life in theater every day, whether in rehearsals or on a full production and production meeting. Um, uh, other things with cases, just general, sort of what you were saying uh, about Sages is just, um, you know, I, I chose Case 2 because it's a Bachelor of Arts program, not a Bachelor of Fine Arts, and I, I didn't want the conservatory training that you get with a BFA. I wanted that well-rounded liberal arts education, and you know, taking classes like Sages, where I learned about uh, music journalism and uh, uh, climate change, and also studying geology and lunar geology and things like that. I mean, it, I, it was great to sort of just for the brain, I think, to have that well-rounded thing, and then translating directly to directing. It's as a director, you use everything you know, and you'll never know enough, but you use everything you've ever learned and will ever learn because you know, you're know, you creating these different worlds for people on stage, and you never know what show you're going to be working on next. So to have a little knowledge about Lunar Mare or Occluded Fronts is nice. So to expand a little bit on the idea of networking is, is one, one way you can use that is to work toward achieving a goal, and that's 
that's important, but also one of the things I learned over time and, and starting at Case is it can also be a good way, if you even if you don't have that goal, to sort of discover uh, new possibilities or get inspiration. Um, so that's one thing that I, I definitely learned and experienced here. Um, another thing that I did at Case that I think is pretty important is not to not take the academic aspect too seriously and forget about extracurricular activities and um, kind of doing projects and, and exercising some creativity and, and doing interesting work and that's something that I think benefited me and also um, as now being in a position to be an, an employer of engineers, it's something that I look for in new grads is, is that well-roundedness. Okay. You all have achieved success already. And um, I'm curious if we could build a picture of how you collectively define career success, taking this view at this point in your lives. Uh, well, the one thing I always wanted to do is pair passion with education. And I was always passionate and loved film and television and that whole world. And so I think success for me is just being happy and excited every single solitary day to go to work. Um, I, my family's come to visit me and they, I have them take the Warner Brothers tour around the, around the lot, which is so much fun and so cool. But my boss always says, honestly, probably on a weekly basis, he goes, we work somewhere where people spend money to take a tour of that. And that is so special and something I never take for granted. And that's such the Warner Brothers culture to just really be appreciative of of what we've been given. So I think success for me is just being really happy at my job as well as finding new challenges and, and room to grow. And so I think that's just been really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll echo that and say um, yes, success means personal satisfaction and that's important, but I think it's also a bit of a cop out when you say success that there's a societal component to that and doing something that people think is interesting and awesome and I feel really fortunate that I happen to be doing something that people do seem to think is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that there's a there's this perception of success. There's like sparkly things that uh, kind of aren't. I don't think necessarily are the success, but kind of come with it. And I've, I've been lucky. I've worked with um, a lot of you know flashier names like Judy Dench and um, in New York. I did a show with Jessica Chastain um, and David Strathairn and Dan Stevens. I did a show with Robin Williams, and those are nice names and they sort of set off little like sparkly yeah. feelings for everybody um, but it's I think it's it's sort of a byproduct of it you know if uh, it comes it comes with the work and I think I think success is just a lot about going in and doing the work whether it's mm -hmm. finding those positions that are out there or creating your own opportunities to have that work happen um, and and sort of as that comes along then you get sort of the, the fancy bits too Hearing about those characteristics of success and the, the results, and the sparkles, you know, the results of that. Um, let's hear about the other side, because I'm sure each of you works very hard, and each of you has a very different career. What are some of the challenges that you face in each of your careers? Um, I, one that I face, in, not on a day-to-day -day basis, but that I sometimes think about is I, I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I know what I want to do. <laughs> I mean, I love what I'm doing at Pebble, but I don't think I'm going to be doing that for 40 years and trying to, to figure out what the future is going to bring. Sometimes I'm not sure about that, and that, I guess that's a challenge. Um, for, uh, I think for me, it's, uh, it's certainly just having, having work, I think, is a, is a big challenge to theater because every project is finite. I mean, you know, a lot of companies or startups or um, film, television productions, those are, you know, have a short shelf life, so to speak, in the grand scheme. But especially for theater, you know, and, and as a director, too, your job's over as soon as the play opens. So it's a lot of, you know, finding that next opportunity, creating that next thing, um, which is... Um, difficult for two reasons. I mean, there's um, there's a lot of people who want to be directors, you know. So there's um, one of my mentors always talks about the director in the next room. You always need to be aware of him because he's he's he or she will be there, and you know 
take that job from you or would direct the scene better than you, so you always need to be on the ball. Um, and the other challenge is just there's um, fewer jobs or opportunities or it's more difficult to create those just with a decline in funding, really. And, uh, you know, uh, the sort of ripple effect of the recession and, and things like that. There's less arts funding, there's less um, sort of capital going around generally to fund art projects, theater projects, um, education programs, and that, you know, that makes it challenging too. And uh, one thing I've actually found challenging is it can be, you know, such an honor to be recognized for being young at, and young and having success. But on the other side of the coin, at least for me in my job, uh, I'm like 10 years younger than like the next person in my office, and so it, there's this there's a fine balance between you know I am so new and I'm getting trained and I'm learning it, but uh, kind of holding your own. So you know when I get calls from agents, it's so easy to Google somebody and pull it up on you know LinkedIn, and then they just kind of attack because they know you've only been out for a year, and so it's kind of uh, being able to hold your own in a room and and kind of. Uh, have confidence but still know that you have to learn a lot. So that's kind of been a challenge for me as well as uh, I think I have a tendency, especially because I am so new in my department, to second guess myself. And I know that'll you know, go away with experience and different opportunities, but you know, the more you do it, the more I feel comfortable. And I just had my one year at Warner Brothers on Tuesday, so I was just telling my mom yesterday, I'm finally feeling like I know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I, every day I come in and be like, why are they giving this to me? They must be crazy. So I'm finally getting comfortable in, in what I'm doing in my role. But I think that'll just come with, with time. Okay. It's clear that each of you is enjoying what you're doing and you're getting challenge and satisfaction out of it. I'm, I'm curious, what are some of the things that you do to achieve some kind of balance so that it isn't all about work? Oh, I do wish you I, achieve balance? I wish I could achieve some sort of balance. And it, it's, it's not work's fault. Um, Pebble is a very uh, a work-life balance friendly company. And yeah, we're a startup and we don't work 9 to 5, 40 hours a week. But we don't, we don't drive ourselves crazy working late or weekends or whatever um, in general. But I do really love what I do. And that's, I'm very lucky to be able to, to do that. But it's also sometimes I find it personally um, hard to pull myself away from work even if there's no real pressure to do that. Mm -hmm. I love turning my phone off actually, so I don't really find that hard of a balance. <laughs> uh, I've been pretty lucky. My department actually is like a like 9 to 6.30, so I do have a good amount of free time and I just moved to LA, so you know, me and my husband have spent a lot of time exploring and, and doing new things, but uh, I think it's important to definitely turn your phone off because we're so connected right now and that's you know it's important to give yourself that time to to refresh and, and regroup i mm -hmm. think it makes you a better product for the next day definitely yeah i think like taking time and, and being okay with taking that time to step away from from meetings or more research or whatever it is to recharge your batteries and just sort of enjoy life and watch a football game or you know spend time with friends it's uh it's really important and it does make you a better artist or director or whatever the next day for sure. Um, I think also like a, um, just a good support network is fantastic. Um, like having friends and family or relationships where you, that can sort of take you away and where you don't feel the pressure to be talking about theater all the time or things like that. Like that's really, really valuable. Um, yeah, yeah, that's good. So as someone who's creating technology that some folks use to be more connected and plugged in. Right. Uh, I actually think about that a lot and how can, how can we build technology and how can people use technology that, that helps them feel as connected as they need to be but not have too much pressure from that. Mm -hmm. Interesting, another delicate balance, I think. Yeah. Looking looking out into the future in the, in the, um, from the eyes or in the eyes of the, the students who are here, either undergraduates or graduate students who are here today, what do you think are some of the big opportunities that are out there over the next 10 or 15 years for our current students? Well, to, to echo kind of what we've been saying the whole time is just alumni, alumni, alumni. Like everything that I have on my slate for the next year plus is working with alumni of the um, undergraduate program here, the graduate acting program, like that's, that's where my work is coming from and th those are the collaborators that I have in New York who I'm making work with and 
you know, whatever department or field of study you're in, I think, you know, diving in and really leaning on those connections, you know, not being too, uh, too shy or, uh, you know, humble or modest to really aggressively go after them because we're out there and, you know, want to help. And, and to add to that, I think uh, something that kind of took me a, a little bit to grasp or kind of embrace, but I, I would tell all young students now that your 20s are the times to take the risks and, and kind of leave practicality aside which I know my mom is probably like laughing right now because she's so practical. But I would say if you're going to be in your 20s and you want it, you have a dream, 100% go for it. Take the risk. Roll the dice. As long as you're going to back that risk up with you know, hard work and focus and passion and energy. But you know, from what I've seen of all case students, I think they really embody that. So I would just say go for it. So I'll, I'll echo all that. But from specifically an engineering perspective, um, it's becoming easier than ever for people with ideas to um, build in companies and commercialize those ideas. And that's something that um, in Silicon Valley, software engineers have always had that opportunity. It's been pretty easy. But I think in other areas of engineering, that's getting easier and easier um, to find funding and manufacturing support and all the other things that it takes to, to build products and that's a, an opportunity that's more and more open to even new grads. This is terrific advice. In addition to the advice and perspectives you've shared, is there anything that you know now that you wish you had known when you were students here at Case Western Reserve University? Uh, just, take that one? Yeah, sure, I'll do that. Um, yeah, just not to, it's, I mean, it's serious and, you know, it's a, it's important, you need to do well in school and do well on your projects and everything, but it's also, it's, it's still school, it's still safe, and it is your early, early 20s, and it's important to just, I think, I, I don't know, like be nicer, I guess, like is a little bit for me, because I, you know, uh, running improvement and running the theater group, I'm sure I was, uh, a little harder maybe on some of the people I was working with, you know, just because it is like, oh, well, this is, this is everything, this is everything, and it's, uh, it's we're, you know, we're having fun, you know, and I think that, that goes across the board. Um, also, it's uh, it, East Cleveland University Circle is incredible, and I kick myself all the time for not spending more time at the museums, for not going to more concerts uh, at Severance Hall and things like that. I, uh, wish that when I was here, I would have been doing all that a lot more. <laughs> I agree. They build a law school li library, right? So the, all the windows face museum, but you have so much work you can never actually go. But I stared at it for three years. <laughs> but I agree. I wish I would have taken. I mean, I'm from Cleveland, so I, I had enjoyed those opportunities. But yeah, when you're in that world, or at least law school, you're like, this is so important. This is everything. Every, you know, every test and every time a teacher calls on you and all that. And I think taking a step back and realizing, you know, there's, there's going to be something after, and it's, and it's okay to breathe and, and have a little fun and, and relax. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, one thing I totally regret, when I was studying for the California bar, I missed my cousin's first birthday party. And I look back at that now, I'm like, why did I not go to that? That was so silly. But in the moment, you're like, I need those eight hours or I'm going to fail this test. <laughs> so I think definitely calming down and realizing that you know, eight hours isn't going to make or break your career, and it's, and it's okay mm -hmm. to go out there and, and just live your life a little more. Balance. Balance. Yeah. Maybe this would help with your, you don't know what you want to be when you grow up. Uh, if you could come back to CWRU to earn another degree, what would it be? I'll start with any of you. Sure. Um, so I guess one thing I might like, to, maybe this will be a retirement, um, indulge my, my sort of liberal arts side and um, when I do serious reading, a lot of it's um, history and philosophy of science uh, and social impact of technology and that kind of thing. So may maybe that could turn into an academic thing. Um, for more of an engineering slant on things, um, I systems and control is something that I didn't really understand the importance of as an undergrad and something that I wish I would have taken more classes in. So for those of you who 
aren't control theorists in the audience, that's basically robot building. Um, and for those of you who are, sorry for that glib characterization. <laughs> <laughs> Can you probably notice, is there like a screenwriting program here? Uh, through the English department, yeah. yeah. That's what That's I would, good. then, yeah. yeah, I choose that. <laughs> no. I would do screenwriting. I really, uh, in my job, I was saying one of the things I enjoy most is instead of just wearing my lawyer hat all the time, I do get to read the scripts and go to table reads and, and watch, you know, uh, just run-throughs and tapings, and I, I love it, and I really gravitate towards that. So if I could probably embrace that creative side, I would have done that. Um, I think if I was going to be a little bit indulgent, probably like art history or music or something, just because that's, uh, I just love that and I get to do a lot of that with theater and with directing. Um, but I don't, maybe physics? I don't know. So that's a little bit off the beaten path. But I, a lot of like theater is a lot of, at least for me, you know, it's a lot about energy and uh, transference of energy and things like that. So I think to kind of uh, attain some of the more uh, practical, Nuts and bolts of that would be great. Always opportunities to come back and see those museums and take some courses. <laughs> um, what I would like to do is open it up to you. I have more questions I could ask, but if you have questions on your mind, I'd like to give you that chance. So if you have a question, raise your hand. And we have a couple people with microphones who will help get the question out here. And here, oh, here we go. I'd like to hear more about the watch. The watch, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, feel free to talk to me after or two, um, but I'm wearing one today. Um, it's a watch that connects by Bluetooth to a phone um, and can work with smartphone apps. Um, so a lot of people use it for fitness apps to have easier access to that information kind of when they're on the move um, or to get notifications and be able to read text messages and so forth. Um, without taking out your phone. Well, you know, we've come a long way. I remember as a kid reading the Dick Tracy comic strips, and yeah. he had that two-way wrist radio. I said, that's totally impossible. Where will you put the batteries? Where will you put the tubes? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's possible now. Um, that's, that's a pretty common reaction when, when I show it off or when we, we, when we talk about the watch. And then the, then the next question is, is can I talk into it? Can I use it as a phone? Uh, not yet, but maybe that'll be next. Version two. Version two. two. <laughs> Other questions? For those of us not under 30, what's the acronym SAILS refer to? I think you used it. Oh, SAGES. Sages. Oh. SAGES. Oh, yeah. That's. I can. Seminar. Actually, I'll, I'll, do you know what oh, it stands I do. for? I, I do. Don't I'd be in trouble if I didn't. Um, it's the seminar approach to general education and scholarship. And so it's a series of courses that all our students take. Doesn't matter what your major, it can be physics or theater or anything else. Um, all our students go through this set of SAGES courses. So there's a first seminar, which is a four credit hour seminar that students take their first semester of freshman year. And then there are two university seminars. And all of, all of the options are open to anyone, anyone in any discipline. Then the next one is a departmental seminar. So they're figuring by around junior year, students have figured out what they want to major in or specialize in. And so the department sem seminar then would be focused more specifically on a person's academic pursuits. And then in addition to that, there's a senior capstone course. And the senior capstone course, again, most typically is taken uh, within the field that one's pursuing, but, it, but one could go outside of that. Uh, one of the common themes, well, several common themes, and, it, and it's in that acronym. So the seminar approach. So for example, our freshmen, instead of sitting in very large lecture halls and learning about composition or literature, uh, they're experiencing it in small classroom settings. So 15, 16, 17 people in a classroom. And they're very experiential from the standpoint that in the freshman seminar, they also get out and explore university circle and take advantage of the museums and uh, other resources here on campus. And so students are learning to do research. They're learning to think and analyze. They're learning to write and communicate orally through both the, um, the discussions as well as the presentations. And that's a common theme that goes throughout all of the, the seminars. Okay. Other questions? Uh, 
Thank you. My name's Ian. I have kind of a touchy-feely question, so I hope you'll bear with me. Great. But uh, I'm maybe five years older than you, and, and somebody in a, I work at Case now. Somebody in a meeting recently suggested to me that, that my generation or your generation was, was different than theirs, in that we have been marketed to by a very powerful marketing force, the US television uh, and so forth. And they thought that we would see college um, as a thing that you buy. And you, get, you have to get that degree, you pay for it, you go through it, and then you're done with it. <clears throat> I think by your coming back to campus and speaking with us, you're saying there's more to it than just the degree, just uh, sort of getting, going through the motions and getting that piece of paper. But I was wondering how you, how you felt about your relationship with the school, how, how connected you feel with the school, um, that sort of topic. Is that cogent? Yeah. I can say with full confidence that I, am, I owe my entire career to case law. Um, I wouldn't have had this opportunity or the job without the alumni. And aside from that, without the support of Dean Mitchell, uh, he, was the, he, he became the dean at the very end of my second year. And he was the first person to really believe in me when I would say, this is what I want to do. I'm not a flake. I swear, I, I love it. I'm going to work so hard. And he, he looked at me and was like, all right, let me, I'm going to give you the contact information. I know you can do this. And we met, and he was so encouraging. So I, I feel very connected to the school, and um, I keep in touch with him and um, another dean and another professor of mine who was very influential in uh, the trademarks class, which would make sense for what I do, because it's the soft IP side. So I, I feel very connected. And, and I still have friends who are, who are law students there now, and um, I talk to them all the time. So I feel like I have a pretty good dialogue with what's going on today. I don't think while I was here, certainly while I was finishing, I realized how uh, much a part the university, how much a part of me the university would still be, however many years it has been now. Like, um, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a huge part of me. And even just, you know, I was talking about support networks and everything, but it, it, you know, I think it keeps you honest. Like, I'm in touch with my theater professors um, constantly, whenever I'm back in Cleveland, I always see them and they make time to see me. And that, like, there's, um, I, don't, I don't know, like, you leave, but you don't, you know? It's, it's always here for you. Uh, it, is a, it is a place to call home amongst the many homes that you accumulate in life. Uh, and and I, I, that's really special. I mean, I think, yeah, it's, it's just a really special thing. And um, it, I don't know, it gives you a place to come back to and remember who you are, but also, you know, it's nice to have people rooting for you and um, the possibility to do things here again or just have, have people cheering you on is really, really important. I think the reason that a lot of people go to school or should go to school is not just the degree, but that it's sort of like a safe place to experiment and try different things and figure out what you want to do and take classes in things that are maybe unrelated to your intended major and meet people and all that's really important, maybe even more important than the degree itself. And is that still a product you can buy? Maybe, but it's, it's not just the degree. Mm -hmm. Question over here. Uh, what you just said there um, about taking the time to experiment and try things you wouldn't, all three of you seem like you came out of college, out of Case Western Reserve having known what you wanted to do when you went in. Um, uh, maybe, Tim, I wish I had known when I started school that I wasn't going to be a math professor because there, there's things I would have done um, I may have picked a different major, I may have done something else, of course then I wouldn't have been my wife, but <laughs> what would you tell to a student coming in who doesn't know what they're doing yet? Doesn't know what, um... what, what they're going to be doing in four years. What do you tell a freshman who doesn't know what they're going to be doing in four years? Think... Yeah, if they, I mean if they don't know, I'd say just, you know, do everything and, and try everything, you know, take the, Take, even if it's you take those four years to experiment and you come out with some sort of mishmash degree that you figure out spring of your senior year, even that's like going to be really valuable. Um, I think 
two, and you know, I think I, I'm very lucky. My parents were very, very supportive of me studying theater. Um, I, I know for a fact that not all parents feel that way, and I, I can understand that with economics or whatever, but even if it's like, well, maybe I want to study theater, or maybe I want to study sociology or whatever, like it, um, still come and do that. Like those, those degrees will serve you um, even if you don't end up working in theater or whatever field you study in. Um, but it's, you know, it's, a, a university is an incredible thing. I mean, there's, there's so much going on. There's more going on here than you'll ever be able to do or experience in four years. But just being here and absorbing that and being a part of that, whether it's a fencing team or an engineering class or going to see a play or, uh, you know, getting involved with a music group, like there's, it's all there. And that's, you know, your early 20s are so, such a formative time. And, um, I don't know, just showing up and experiencing it, I, you know, I guess uh, be, be okay with not knowing. That's it. That's what you should do. And I think it's just as important to learn what you don't want to do as what you do want to do. Mm. Um, my first summer, uh, after my 1L year, I ended up clerking for a federal judge, which is a great opportunity, and I hated it, and it was horrible for me personally. And it taught me that I don't want to work in the courts and I don't want to work in a law firm. And that's, learning that is just as valuable is learning at IMG that I did want to work in sports entertainment. So try new opportunities and, and be open-minded because learning what you don't like is just as important as learning what you do, especially when you're young, because that can help you focus you to where you want to go. Yes, I definitely agree with that. This is a, it's tough for me to answer because I wasn't quite in this situation. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do when I got out of school, but I had a pretty good idea of what it would sort of be like. Um, but I guess if I did have to give some advice, it would be don't commit too early and pretend you know what you want to do. Um, explore as broadly as you can and try and figure it out over time. I'll add one quick comment, which is for our undergraduate students, we have a single door admission policy. So students are admitted to the university, not a particular program. And so students do have that opportunity to explore. And they have several, well, four semesters before they have to really declare a major. And even then, it's very easy if one decides to change. So for, the, for undergraduates in particular who don't have that focus, we really have a wonderful institution here. That was, think, a, that was a huge deciding factor for me. That's great to hear yeah. that. Yeah. And we also, I think, have many flexible programs so that students can major in one thing but minor in something that's very different, so they still get that exposure. I think we have time for one more question, if we have one more. And if not, I'm going to throw one more question out. And I'll ask if there were any questions you prepared for but you weren't asked, and, and therefore any parting comments you want to make. You guys can go first. No, and if there aren't, there aren't, then we're done. I think just, we're, we're all, all right. honored to be here. So yeah. thank you for having us. Thank yeah. you yes. all. This is very, you know, very nice to come back. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was wonderful.